Uh, thank, thank you, Lori. Uh, good morning to everyone. My name's Tom Gonzales. I'm the vegetable crop specialist with uh, Manitoba Ag Agriculture and Resource Development. I'd like to welcome you to the fourth webinar in this year's 2021 Horticulture School Summer Webinar Series. The group that uh, is behind planning and presenting the uh, Horticulture School webinars involves staff from Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development, uh, Cinnaboyne Community College, and Agriculture Agri-Food Canada. Um, today's webinar is uh, in the form of a Q&A. There's been a few questions that have come in, and we're going to endeavor to answer them. But for those who are attending live, feel free to, if you have questions, to type them into the question feature there. We have moderator uh, looking at that uh, feature or checking it out, and we will endeavor to provide you answers if you have any questions. We're going to cover uh, our plan today is to cover three general areas. Um, one, uh, first one we'll talk about, and we tried to do it last week, or sorry, two weeks ago, but we had a bit of a technical glitch here in Carmen and. Vikram and I were cut off. So we're going to endeavor to uh, talk about uh, the possibility of uh, over fertilization or wrong timing of fertilizer applications to transplants in the greenhouse. Um, secondly, we're going to talk potential about potential group one uh, resistance, uh, herbicide resistance in uh, foxtail and millet. Um, Third one, we're very topical nowadays with the weather we're having. We're going to have a discussion on irrigation uh, concerns and issues. Uh, and a question that came in was uh, what volume of water can a produ producer take from a full flow water course without a water license? We're going to answer those that question and have a discussion on some other issues regarding uh, irrigation. Um, before we get into the meat, shall we say, of uh, today's webinar, Laurie, could you launch the first two general questions for me? I sure can. Okay, Thank you very so much. You should, you should see it right now. How do you see yourself with the horticultural industry? So you can sub select one producer of horticultural pro crops work in agri-supply and agribusiness, government or university personnel, or other. So you can select one and submit your answers. I know we've asked these questions each time, but it really helps uh, collect information that uh, helps future webinars. Okay, I'll give it a couple more seconds here. People are still voting. And okay, so I'll share the results. So we have 40% producer of horticultural crops, 10% work in agri supply, agribusiness, 40% government or university personnel, and 10% others. So that's a great mix. Yeah, it's interesting. So the next one, I'm going to do the first two, right, Tom? Yes, yeah, please. Okay. If you are a horticultural producer, what size is your farm? If you could select one, zero to 4.9 acres, five to 14.9 acres, 15 to 49.9 acres, or 50 plus acres. Votes are coming in. Really fast this morning. Everyone's on the ball, ready for these questions now. Okay. So here's the results. 33% zero to 4.9 acres, 50% five to 14.9 acres, 0% 15 to 49.9 acres and 17% 50 plus acres. Okay. 
Well, uh, as Gloria said, uh, we have asked those questions before, but what, what it helps us in knowing who is attending the uh, individual uh, webinars. So I appreciate everybody taking the time to uh, answer those. Um, as I alluded to in my preamble there, if you attended the last webinar two weeks ago, we had the uh, technical glitch in Carmen that uh, caused uh, Vikram and I to be cut off. Uh, I'd like to think that was uh, not, not a, a plan uh, Laurie had to uh, cut us off, and uh, we're going to try again here. Um, Can you just hold on one second, Tom? I'm having a challenge um, sh closing the poll. Okay. Um, just give me one moment. If you don't mind oh yeah no problem not a problem uh what are you seeing right now um sarah am, can you tell me if you're seeing the poll or if you're seeing john's tom's presentation um it's the poll Lori. okay i'm just going to send the uh, present presentation to you sarah for a moment maybe i can just wiggle this thing loose okay so you can Do you want okay. me to show Mine. yours? No, I'm going to bring it back to Tom and see if it wiggles it loose here. Okay. Do you want me to go show screen? Yes, please. Uh, okay, we've we go. got it back. Yep. Okay, yep. well, thank you uh, very much, Lori, for doing the techno uh, wizardry there. Um, okay, so uh, b basically what we... Uh, I'll get into the slides here. What we got, uh, Vikram and I were uh, were called to uh, visit a producer in May where uh, we saw some transplants that uh, had reduced vigor, uh, losing their lower leaves. Uh, you can see in the pictures there, the producer was wondering if they have a disease we couldn't really find any disease apparent on the plants. Yeah, the photograph on the right side bottom, it uh, almost appears to be like uh, early blight. And the uh, grower had sent samples to one company and uh, they said, yeah, there are uh, spores of uh, alternaria in there. And so they were, putting fungicides and everything. And the problem was still continuing to grow even more severe. So we took uh, samples of the uh, plants which were looking uh, weird. Uh, they were having curly leaves uh, and what appeared to be nitrogen deficiency. So, and uh, then uh, some of the plants had been discarded because they were no good and they were being returned from uh, other growers who had bought these plants. So the grower was concerned, called us over, and we decided to make sure that uh, we know what the real reason is. So we went for a nutrient uh, analysis of the PTOs. Uh, and in this, you would notice that almost every nutrient is either uh, high or very high, and just calcium is sufficient. And so that is uh, the problem that uh, they continued to feed, uh, even though the plants did not need that much. And so it was basically a phytotoxicity of um, multiple uh, elements. And so it is important that the growers who are trying to grow seedlings for themselves or others uh, feed but not too much and uh, this is what uh, could happen and so we are going to make a, a I can say a nutrient program for the uh, growers and others who may be interested so we will do that uh, in the uh, winter time um yeah and if we want to and and this picture that's on your screen right now those are those same transplants uh taken or uh, picture taken earlier this week uh basically uh they were transplanted fairly late but you can see 
relatively healthy looking uh, crop, I mean. Uh, so yeah, they, they, they seem to recover. <clears throat> Soil is a good buffer and it can take care of a lot of problems, but not everything in the cell trays. Okay, and uh, there were a lot of uh, calls that uh, I have been receiving and they appear to be, what kind of disease is this? But in most cases, it appears that uh, it is a drift from uh, lawn maintenance. And there were a few, uh, calls from potato growers uh, as to are you sure this is uh, herbicide damage but uh, the pattern of uh, uh, the injury on the crop is uh, a very clear sign that uh, the tank was not cleaned and then uh, there's misapplication that happens sometimes and there are soil residues I got a call today and uh, the Agronomist wanted to know if uh, uh, group four overlap in wheat uh, in the previous year can impact. Uh, I don't have the answer for that one, So, uh, but the symptoms looked uh, very typical uh, on potatoes, uh, group four herbicide uh, damage. So <clears throat> uh, quite often uh, we uh, suggest or advise that, you know, when the winds are a bit strong, especially if going to a uh, sensitive crop, please make sure that the wind is in the uh, right direction or it is not very windy. These are some of the herbicide damage. This is uh, Odyssey, uh, which is a group two, and uh, it can really uh, spoil the potatoes and uh, not just uh, this year's, but the next year's seed crop. Uh, glyphosate, uh, sometimes uh, we try to, uh, uh, you can say spray some areas and then there's a drift. You can see typically uh, in the center of the new growing points, you have a very yellow uh, discoloration and that is very typical of uh, Roundup. Uh, this is uh, Liberty. A lot of uh, people think Liberty is uh, uh, contact herbicide, but uh, in potatoes, the Liberty goes into the seed as well, and it will spoil next year's uh, seed crop as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, it may be contact for certain, uh, you can say projects, but uh, on potatoes is, is uh, you can say systemic. Uh, this is uh, again group two in uh, uh, sandy soils. I'm going to go quickly. This is the kind of uh, uh, symptoms that uh, I'm getting photographs from many people. Uh, and uh, just today I got something very similar. Uh, not a disease, but uh, uh, group four. And uh, we need to investigate. Here's a very typical example of improper uh, tank cleaning, you can see that uh, the herbicide is uh, impacting a certain area, and then after that, the uh, you know the symptoms finish. I'm going to just skip over this. Uh, this is Roundup. Uh, corn was sprayed, and there was a drift onto the uh, his own field of uh, potatoes. So you can spray drift onto your own crops. <laughs> Okay, and uh, this is something that <clears throat> I had uh, not included in the previous one, uh, glyphosate uh, in sandy soils on emerged and sprouted uh, seed tubers was able to reduce the emergence. And uh, this was done in Winkler CMCDC. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, in my opinion, <clears throat> if there is, uh, rain event soon after herbicide application of Roundup and uh, the, uh, you can say, or uh, there's uh, rain or irrigation, it will go in onto the potato sprouts and reduce. But if the potatoes have not sprouted or the seed of any other crop has not sprouted, it may not be affected very much. 
so this was the uh, information on that. Okay, this is uh, the stuff that I did uh, on a Frito-Lay variety uh, in uh, China. And uh, there we had uh, the whole field uh, which was sprayed with Roundup because the uh, uh, agronomists thought uh, Roundup is uh, going to work very well. And the mini tubers that we had planted here, <clears throat> they were sprouted and so uh, the roundup reached the growing points and reduce. So this was a sample of that. Uh, just a few days ago, <clears throat> went to uh, a colony and they said, you know, what's happening to our peas? <clears throat> this is a very uh, good example of uh, uh, poor uh, watering because it is dry. And this is uh, infection with fusarium wilt fungus so this fusarium wilt becomes more serious when it is uh, dry and these people were unable to irrigate in time uh, these are some of the roots that you can see they're getting infected and uh, the lab uh, is going to just uh, confirm uh, whether it was a correct diagnosis or not but certainly it's a root infection now, uh, most people will be seeing septoria or uh, alternaria leaf spots. And uh, uh, fortunately, you can control these two diseases with the same fungicides for practical purposes. It is uh, the same uh, leaf spots. Uh, but if you want to know a bit more different between these two, uh, the septoria has uh, uh, gray centers and a brown uh, outside uh, margin, whereas uh, the alternaria leaf spots have concentric rings, and in many cases they will have some yellow halo around them, but it is in both cases. So uh, this is uh, maybe important for pathologists, but for practical growers uh, it is uh, not very critical. Both can be controlled with uh, Bravo, Mancozeb, and many other fungicides. Uh, we may uh, see some of this problem in 2016. This was really severe. And this is the uh, stink uh, bug damage on the right side. And uh, because of the saliva, they inject into uh, the fruit, uh, green to red, you will have uh, these uh, spots. Uh, they become hardened, and uh, uh, I'm not sure they're good to eat, but uh, you can eat them. Uh, late blight, I don't think we'll see that this year, so just so that you remember what it looks like, <laughs> this is what I have shown it. <laughs> One year we got it in mid-October, so uh, it is uh, still possible. Yeah. And then... Uh, this is uh, when some of the growers getting garlic from uh, Ontario uh, had a very bad uh, crop and uh, they wanted to know what is happening here. So at the bottom, you can see the base plate is completely rotten. It is a garlic uh, uh, stem and bulb nematode problem. So please ensure that the seed that you get from different places are clean. And we are seeing lots of aphids uh, nowadays, uh, which is important for seed potato growers and maybe soybean growers if it becomes an issue. Otherwise, right. that's the end of the topic. If you have any questions, please do ask. Well, one of the things that uh, came in this morning uh, was a, a question regarding, they had a generic version of glyphosate uh, they sprayed in the spring. Uh, didn't give the exact timing of the application and then uh, let it sit for uh, three, four weeks and uh, rotivated, uh, I'm assuming there was a perennial weed problem, then rotivated the uh, field, um, planted the seed. Again, they didn't say specifically which vegetable crop, but uh, they're asking question about vegetables. Are the vegetables safe to eat? Does it make a difference between if root crops 
or above ground vegetable crops are planted after generic glyphosate application. I would let uh, Kim answer that, but my opinion we, is that uh, uh, after two, three, uh, four days or a week of uh, application and cultivation, there is uh, no glyphosate available for the plants to take up. Yeah, we talked about it a bit uh, last week, uh, and basically when uh, the active ingredients in glyphosate hit uh, organic matter, they begin to break down into metabolites. And so basically you're spraying a, uh, a crop, letting it sit for three, four weeks, rototilling it uh, and seeding or transplanting into that. Uh, no, no issues that, uh, that I'm aware of. Um, Freddie, Sarah, is there anything showing up in the chat? Or sorry, a question and answer? Tom, um, do you have a slide showing right now? No, we don't. I'll get one back. Great, thanks. There was another question that I was asked recently, and that was uh, thrips on tomatoes. Uh, it is dry and uh, hot, and thrips uh, love to feed on uh, sensitive crops. Uh, these thrips can... Uh, you can say transmit viruses and reduce the tomato production also. So the, there are certain insecticides uh, possible to use. Uh, I will just name the insecticides. Uh, uh, Orthene, Entras, Success, Exeril, there may be a few more, but uh, uh, it is good to control, otherwise uh, the uh, tomato patch uh, will become all Infested. Um, were there any any questions showing up in the? No, so there are no questions, but we do encourage everyone to send in any questions that they may have. Okay. Well, we'll we'll move on to the next part. Um, I, I sent him a text saying we yep. were getting started on the next part, so we'll see I'm, how that works out. I'm. I'm here, Tom. Can you hear me? Oh, right on. Way to go. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna interrupt for one more moment. Sorry, Tom. Can you go to display settings and swap your screen, please? Oh yes. My bad. I That's forgot. all right. Just well, make it the best you can. Yep. Perfect. Right. Um, okay, so part two of our discussion this morning deals with a question that was uh, sent in to me that uh, deals with group one resistant foxtail and millet. And Kim Brown is going to uh, help us out here, the uh, agriculture specialist. The question that came in was, I sprayed parts of my vegetable field with post-ultra in the first week of July, but the foxtail and millet were not controlled as well as they were in past years. What caused this problem and what options do I have now to control the large weeds? So really, it sounds like this person has had the issue before because they say the foxtail wasn't controlled as well as in the past. So any, any thoughts, uh, Kim? Well, um, first of all, I mean, it, it's been a difficult year for weed control just because the extreme, we went from basically within a week, just about uh, freezing temperatures, very cold nights, all the way on to very, very hot. So really, depending when you sprayed, some of our group ones don't do very well if they're sprayed after a cool night, and you need to have a period of a few good growing days before they you spray them and they work well. And then in the extreme heat again, you know, once we, we hit some temperatures that it was just too hot to be spraying. So that's a function of how the herbicide works, but then also the weeds, when it, when they've been under challenging growth conditions, they, they harden off, we call it. So sometimes they get... They just get harder to kill, especially under the heat. They get a waxy layer on the leaves. The cuticles get thicker. It's harder for the herbicide to penetrate. So in general, we've had probably poorer herbicidal control this year of some of our weeds. I so that's agree. something to keep in mind. You would, you would agree? Yeah, like I think that that's, we've seen that in a lot of places. But otherwise, but 
is very valid though. There, there very well could be um, an increase in resistance. Um, there's really no way to know that unless you actually take mature seeds. So you have to wait for those foxtails and you call them millet, but I'm assuming we're talking about green foxtail and yellow foxtail. Um, and you take that seed and you get mature seed and then it can be sent to a lab. Um, in Manitoba, we would be using EggQuest. That's a private company in Minto, but they do a really good job. And you send them the seed and they have a protocol for growing it out. And then they basically spray it with a bunch of different things um, to see whether or not it gets killed or not. So that's really the only way you know for sure. There's no tissue test. There's no other way of knowing. So you'd have to get mature seed. If you're going to wait and, um, and do that, maybe, you know, uh, leave some of it to go to, to, to maturity so you get that mature seed. Otherwise, there's nothing you can spray now, especially on a big weed. Um, when you're looking at our pre-harvest intervals, most of them were too far gone. We don't have enough time. And spraying a big mature weed that's probably headed out by now anyways is not going to do anything. You're revenge spraying. You're not going to kill it. You're not going to help it. Um, you're just, um, you're, you're going to, if anything, increase um, resistance because you're spraying a herbicide and you're not killing it and, and that's a very good way of increasing resistance is to spray and not kill something so for now I would say there's no chemical way that you can fix that um, but you'd be looking at mowing or hand roguing or, or some way of, of physical control of those weeds but I would encourage you to keep some of them at least um, let them go to maturity save those seeds and um, and get them sent away for um, uh, for analysis to see if it truly is a herbicide resistance issue. Right, and and I think uh, the hand roguing part at a point becomes uh, really the uh, the only viable option in in most uh, most vegetable crops. Uh, like to to get in there with a mower or even hand carry a weed whacker or or whatever. It, it's it's pretty awkward. You're you're probably just as well off to uh, to to try to pull them. It's a pain. We've had to do that in plots over the years, and growers have had to do it on on various scales, depending on <laughs> how big or small a field is. And I know it's not easy or fun, but sometimes it's really the only option, depending on what what kind of uh, competition weed competition it's providing you know and what uh, is your field being hand harvested or is it mechanically harvested would the excess weed growth uh, if it's mechanically harvested would it gum up the the harvester and uh, and that so there's there's issues there but uh, roguing certainly seems to to be a problem or be the way to 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 deal with it even though it's not fun We've done that in the past. Um, I, how, how widespread, I wonder, is it? Like I know uh, in our, uh, some of our plots in uh, Portage area, there are some uh, some populations that have some resistances. Do we know if it's common around Manitoba? Um, oh, can you hear me still? Yes. yes. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, it is common. Um, we actually haven't done a weed survey since 2016. And before that, our last provincial wide or province wide weed survey was 2002. So we definitely have seen an increase. Um, I, I could, didn't have the numbers to get to you this morning, but we definitely have seen an increase in, in resistant weeds, um, especially from 2002 all the way to our last weed survey. Uh, we are doing a province-wide weed survey next summer. So in 2022, we're doing that again, and I fully expect to see more resistance. So the resistance is definitely on the increase. Um, there's no two ways about that. So, but again, it is very specific field, specific area specific, but generally our group one and two resistant wild oats are, would be probably my worst weed that I'd be worried about. Um, also group nine resistant kochia, um, but also group one and group two resistant um, green foxtail. We at one point in the province had a big population of group three resistant foxtail, but that was quite a while ago. That was prior to the nineties when we were still using a lot of um, griminicides in our canola and that was when we were using a lot of group threes 
um, like our ed, um, is specifically out in front of canola for weed control because we didn't have the herbicide tolerant canolas. So in the mid 90s, when the herbicide tolerant canolas came became available, um, then we stopped using those group one chemistry for sure in in our in our canola crops. And so uh, our group three resistance has probably gone away a little bit, but that's something that we do have to watch that may be coming back. Um, but there definitely is um, resistance in the foxtails, not as not to the extent that it is in wild oats, but definitely the foxtails, there is some resistance and it is growing. Yeah, and I, th I think the, the big thing to, to sort of take away here is that it's not just isolated to say one production area of the province is, is all I was yeah. getting. No, you know. no, it's all all over. Yeah, the yeah. whole province. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, yeah. And particularly not... the group three resistance was particularly bad uh, south of number one highway, um, and then north of number one highway, we tended to see more group one and group two resistance um, in in the foxtails. Um, but now again, that's kind of that was um, that's not as uh, that line is not there anymore um, because we've gone away from using the group three so much but the, the group one we definitely do now have one and two resistant foxtail south of number one highway right um, um, question come in tom okay. um, amy asks any input on brix levels relation to pest and disease any input on the BRICS levels, which is uh, basically a, a measure of uh, in the, in the vegetable of and and what was the last part relationship to disease and pests? Yeah, pests Any, in general. Okay, so I, I I think what they're asking here is, and whoever put the question in, feel free to if if I my paraphrasing is wrong, feel free to clarify. You're asking, do diseases and pests affect the bricks level in uh, in a test on uh, vegetable crops? Uh, any thoughts, Vikram? There is a possibility. Absolutely. Be, especially if the uh, uh, you can say the take the case of uh, tomatoes. Uh, some of the uh, you can say the uh, stink bug uh, infecting the uh, fruit is going to affect part of it, but not the whole fruit. If there is uh, early blight uh, infection on the fruit, uh, that will also reduce a bit the cooking quality will uh, change slightly but not become impossible so maybe okay to eat raw but the processing quality may change yeah and i i i i think it'd be very it would take some some time and a fair bit of work to quantify what the differences would be but i think it's fair to say that there could be differences based on uh, stresses yeah, the, pests or diseases. Okay. The sweetness may change, but is this uh, related to canning? We can try to find out more information, or is it just a curiosity question? Yeah, we can. Who's ever put that in there? If you want to, I yeah. can unmute Jamie. Jamie, if you like, I can unmute you if you want to clarify further. Yeah, I'd be okay yeah. with. Can you hear me there? Yes. You bet. Yep. Uh, the question was actually more related to um, can we decrease press, pest and disease pressure by uh, trying to increase bricks levels in the plants is more what I was asking. Oh. oh okay. Okay. We were completely. Yeah. Sorry. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Well, I don't know what uh, that. That's an interesting thought. I I am not sure if uh, bricks uh, level would uh, make an impact uh, because many uh, you can say uh, crops which have high bricks levels also get infected. Uh, okay. But uh, John Hurd had a very interesting uh, experiment done. He sprayed. Uh, uh, a weak solution of maple syrup and he sprayed onto uh, some of his uh, plot, some plants, and he found that uh, in some cases there was uh, less 
uh, disease, more yield. Uh, actually, there was no correlation, but uh, he uh, used stats to confirm that uh, spraying maple uh, solution on your crop uh, increases the crop vigor. So if you are uh, referring to some of those kind of things, no, it does not work. Yeah, I, I, it's, a, it's a different thought to, 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 to me. I, I, I could do, a, I, I honestly don't know the answer, I, I guess is what I'm saying. I can look, uh, do some searching around and if you leave, uh, we'll be able to get your uh, contact information from the registration and I can push out uh, an answer to, uh, well, to everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably won't be uh, won't be today, given the fact we're I'll be irrigating as soon as we leave. <laughs> this is done. I'm heading out the water, but uh, um, yeah, I can uh, work on that and see what I can find out and send something out. Uh, that's the best I can tell you right now. I'm sorry, but no, that's perfect. That'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay, right on. Thanks a lot. Um, well, uh, I think uh, we'll move into the uh, last part of our discussion today, which is uh, related to irrigation. And Lori, I'm wondering if you could launch the third question uh, in the poll, please. Well, I'll give it my best shot. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Okay, so the third question, if you are a horticultural producer, how do you rate irrigation and or water availability this season? So you can select one, not a problem, minor use, sorry, minor issue only, major issue due to my irrigation system itself, major issue due to water availability, or major issue due to other reasons. So if you can select one, that would be great. And voting seems to have slowed down, so I will launch the results. Right, so we have 25%, uh, not a problem. 25% minor issue only. 0% major issue due to irrigation system itself. 50% major issue due to water availability and zero for the last one major issue due to other reasons. Okay. And I, I think that's quite, uh, quite topical now given the few things that are going on. Uh, well, I just wanted to, before we get into the next question, poll question, I just wanted to say that, you know, when we're asking these questions, we're basically, uh, trying to uh, be able to get an idea of what issues attendees uh, have um, and, the, and the answers or any comments that are provided to us during these webinars, the, the poll questions or when Jamie was speaking there, uh, or even if we, we have a, a conversation on a, during a, a visit to a farm or wherever, all those answers are, confidential like there's no uh we, we don't share them outside of uh, the horticulture planning group uh when we're trying to come up with content um honest answers are they, they help us basically move uh forward in providing uh content that uh that will assist producers so, so basically, given that we're we're gonna, I'm gonna get Lori to launch the fourth question, and I hopefully uh, I'd like you to answer honestly. Could you launch the fourth question, Lori, please? I sure can. So, you. if you if you are a horticultural producer and irrigate, do you presently have a water use license? So, if you guys can answer yes or no on that, that would be great. Give it a couple more seconds. People are uh, voting. And all right, so I can close and share those results. So we have 50% yes and 50% no. Mm, right down the middle. Okay, that's yeah. interesting to know. Um, 
And the next part, the last part of our discussion here that these questions are leading into is to do with irrigation concerns. And uh, our primary panelist here is Brian Wilson. He's presently acting manager in Manitoba Agriculture. Um, but in a previous life, Brian was a uh, irrigation specialist. And uh, when we had a specific uh, question come in related to what volume of water can a producer take from a full flow water course without a license, uh, I thought maybe we should uh, bring Brian in for a bit of a discussion. So Brian, do you have any uh, thoughts? Well, great. Thanks, everybody. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit about irrigation. And if I can just show my screen, there we go. So I guess the question is, what screen am I showing, and what showed? What I can see right now, Brian, is let's get started. You're connect to go to webinar. So you've got okay. your browser what open. I, what I will do is I'll just drag this into here. That looks great. Okay. So what you're seeing is a Google Earth uh, image um, of the Stephen Field Dam area, correct. which is by Carmen. So that's correct what you're seeing? Correct. Great. We, we have that. So um, what I'm going to talk about today and what Tom asked to talk about, I'm going to talk a little bit about... Uh, where we irrigate in Manitoba, and I'll give a quick overview of the irrigation of what we irrigate in Manitoba. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about water uh, quality, and I'm going to talk a little bit about crop water demand, and then I'm going to touch on licensing. So as Tom said, I work with, with Manitoba Agriculture and Rural Development, and throughout my career with, the, with agriculture, I've done a lot of work as far as how the irrigation industry has expanded. Um, which has mainly gone along with the growth in the potato sector and also to uh, some extent as, as the vegetable industry is growing. So in Manitoba, uh, we are predominantly a dry land province. Like most of our, ir of, of our crop production in the province is non-irrigated dry land. Uh, we irrigate probably in the neighborhood of about 1% of our agriculture land and Predominantly in Manitoba, we irrigate high value crops. We irrigate vegetables, which is, which is virtually if you're a vegetable producer, it's 100% irrigated. Potatoes are mainly irrigated. And the, we do have other rotational crops that get uh, irrigated, especially on some of the lighter textured soils. But we irrigate about 1% of our land. So 99% of our land is, is non irrigated. As far as sources of water that we have, we really have three sources that we use for irrigation. Um, we use groundwater, so we use aquifers in Manitoba. We use water that comes directly out of a river, and the licensing folks refer to that as firm flow, so that you can pump during the summertime if there's water there. We have some water courses this year that don't have water that normally do. And then the the third way that we uh, used water is we capture runoff from the spring snowfall. So it's basically snow melt water that gets captured and held and then it's being able to use later in the, in the year. So that's spring flow. So those are the three sources. So what I'm showing on this screen, the slide that you're seeing in front of us in this area is Stephenfield. It really shows two of those areas. So right at the dam, that supplies water to the Boyne River and there's irrigation that happens directly out of the Boyne as water is released out of that retention structure. And the other one that you're seeing right where my mouse is, is a, is a retention pond. So that is filled in the spring. That, that area is kind of gray and it's just showing the watershed, that's the Boyne River watershed, which flows eventually into the Red River. And I'm just gonna turn that off so it's clear. But that is basically showing uh, the water that comes out of Stephen Field supplying the Boyne is used for irrigation. And then you can see a number of the holding ponds that are in the Boyne River watershed area. Like right here, it's actually showing four water retention structures that end up being used for irrigation. So um, 
a, a water system like this has a budgeted amount. So there's there's basically calculations done as to how much water can be allocated and used during the summer, that firm flow period, and how much can be used during the spring flow period. And that, that is set a water budget. And, and people within our department, agriculture and resource development, are responsible for setting water budget amounts in various courses throughout uh, throughout the province. So we have budgeted amounts on some aquifers and we have budgeted amounts on on uh, this. So that, so that determines the amount of water. So that's basically where we irrigate. Groundwater, uh, rivers, which are spring flows, and the, and the dams end up being very important for holding those and capturing spring flow, which go into retention ponds. So as far as water quality goes, uh, quality ends up being important and um, the majority of quality of water that we have in Manitoba, especially from surface water, is in good supply. Some of the groundwater, if you've got a groundwater source that you're doing, it's definitely worthwhile to make sure that you, you know, that you're dealing with good water quality. There's two things plant don't like as far as, as the two biggies where you start with when you start looking and saying, okay, is, is a water source suitable for irrigation? Plants do not like salt salt causes problems so you look at salinity um, a water test quickly tells you what sort of salinity level you're looking at and then the other very quickly thing that can be a problem with a water quality is sodium soils don't like sodium and high sodium water and irrigation are just not a mix so you know that's where if you're looking at a groundwater and we have very successful groundwater that's used for irrigation because it has good quality but we have areas that have potential salinity problems or sodium problems and that's where you want to talk to like like I can talk to you other people within our department can talk to you Tom can talk to you but th those are the big water quality issues that you uh, need to be aware of as far as how much water a plant uses in these hot dry weather conditions it might be in the neighborhood of, of a quarter of an inch of water demand a year or a day so you know, between a quarter to a third when a crop is actively growing. And throughout the growing season, you know, you'd probably look at a crop needs somewhere between 15 to 20 inches. And this year, we absolutely did not get that kind of rainfall. And that's why, you know, when we know that we've got, you know, serious conditions as far as pastures and other things like that. And that is why for the high value sectors that we irrigate, why we need that water supply it's to it's to supply that regular water that the crop needs in terms of uh to be able to produce the quantity of what we're looking for as well as the quality so that's on the the supply side and then i'm going to slide quickly to the the question that tom talked about and that's licensed water use so in manitoba we have a water rights act and the water rights act is uh, what sets the requirement and depending on how much water you use is what determines whether you need a water rights license or not so when we look in an area that i've got on the screen in front of us the boyne you may not need a water rights license if you're under a threshold amount and it's a determined on daily water use so the act specifies and the regulations specify if you're using less than 25,000 liters per day and that works out to around 6,000 gallons per day you do not need a water rights license you have the legal right to use the water if you're using less than 25,000 liters per day and that's the case it's like people will use the term uh, illegal water use and it's absolutely not illegal if you're under 25,000 day liters per day and that's what you're using you have every legal right to use that water and that is specified in the in the uh, water rights act so um, and and that's really de designed for household use smaller livestock operations smaller um, market garden type of situations and, and that's the threshold it's simply an amount once you get over that amount you do need a water rights license 
and once you have your water rights license that gives you the right to use water on a larger basis so when we're looking in here of what we have is the people that you see there that have a holding pond they absolutely have a water rights license which gives them the right to use that water in the spring and go from there so whether you need a water rights license or not is dependent on size and if you're not a large enough producer to require a water rights license you have every legal right to use that water so i'm just going to quickly summarize what i said so in manitoba we got three sources that we use uh, spring water budget firm flow water budget or rivers and aquifer are our sources for water quality make sure that you don't have a salinity or a sodium problem are your first two big ones that you want to look at um, water supply is really important and in the question you asked, Lori, at the front end about people that have water availability problems, um, we work very closely with our colleagues with Manitoba Infrastructure and the water supply side of our department. So if you're struggling um, and, you know, there are, are certainly ways and options to look for water supply, we're very much interested in hearing your comments. And as far as comments on water goes right now, uh, Manitoba is in the process of developing a water strategy. Uh, the water strategy is on Engage Manitoba. So right now we are seeking the public's input as to the kind of things that should go into provincial water strategy. So we're very much open to hearing your comments and concerns. So if you're expressing those concerns that you have about water availability, um, right now you you have a chance to have that opinion on engage manitoba so with that that's what i had to say and i'd certainly welcome any questions well thanks brian i uh i i think there it, it's very fortuitous that uh, we had planned to have an irrigation discussion this week given the some of the things that uh, have gone on this week uh i've had contact from growers yesterday uh I don't know exactly how many, but I had contact from a few mentioning that they had received uh, modifications or requests to modify their pumping rates uh, for based on their their water license. Uh, I don't know exactly if they were cut in half or exactly what how they were trimmed back, but uh, that that's I, I guess the one of the questions that I get asked to. Uh, often is where does agricultural water use fit in the grand scheme of things in relation to to other uses like uh you know a potable source for uh for a city or town is obviously uh more uh ranked above agricultural use uh any any thoughts or comments on that brian Yeah, Tom, and and I'll go into the area that was that was impacted by that decision, and 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 the decision that was made this week has to do with the the lower Assiniboine um, pump sites. So that that is the area where the LaSalle River is and the Elm River is, and the province operates pump sites that transfer water from the Assiniboine to the Elm River, and to the LaSalle River. And they supply water um, that, that basically flows downstream, and um, you know it flows. Um, the, there's a water treatment plant that the RMA McDonald operates at Sanford, and that system, with the hot, dry weather, water that is getting transferred is just not getting to the water treatment plant. So. It, it's become, they have had water restrictions from the spring and they have other water restrictions as far as water use goes, but the projection was that there was going to be within a few week period, a situation where there just wasn't going to be water available for that water treatment plant. So water, so there's two things that ended up happening as became aware, looking at how to increase the, the amount of pumping that goes into the Elm and the LaSalle in order to get water to that water treatment plant and reducing uses so that's that is where the 
um, discussion came in as in order to reduce the volume for the licenses to uh, decrease the demands on the system and uh, to try to get water to that water treatment plant and go from there. So there is a clause in the license that, you know, that, that does give the authorization. I, it, on this particular one, it's under the Minister of Conservation and Climate. So the Conservation and Climate has that authority in the license to ask people to reduce or in some cases not pump because of water supply issues. Right. So that is the situation that happened and, and uh, you know, it, it takes dialogue and discussion and and you know we we try very much as we can to cooperate with growers and recognize that you know you're, you're dealing with a really difficult situation of low water water supplies high heat uh demand on the system and you know we're dealing with um a dry situation that we haven't had a long period of time and and you just recognize it's really there so that that is a situation that really impacted those uh, that area of the province. There's other areas of the province as well that um, you you know very simply there just isn't water. Uh, there there's not a dam on the water course. Normally there's good flow and there's just not water available. So you know we know in the prairies we deal with floods and we deal with droughts and this is a situation where we're much more in the drought end. Yeah, and I, th I, I think uh, the whole idea of, uh, climate, you know, the climate variability, I, I, I guess, is uh, something that we, uh, we may be moving, uh, moving towards more than uh, in, the, in the past. But I, I, I think it's, it's important for folks to, to see that, you know, when there are issues with water availability, I, I think the province does try their best to not swing a big stick, so to speak, uh, to to try to to work with uh, with folks, albeit uh, in this case they are being pared back, but not cut off. I mean, it's going to impact. Uh, acres that are going to be able to be properly irrigated uh yeah it's just not a good situation but i there, there there's no good answer in a year like this i guess is what i'm trying to say yeah um, and i'm just showing the area the the area of where where those transfers happen so uh that's right by portage la prairie that's the assiniboine river that you're seeing right where the mouse is so right. that is there and there's two water transfer pumps that that work in this area. Right here is where the transfer pump is that transfer water into the alum. And the water treatment or the pump site that transfers water into the LaSalle is right here. And you know, the, those those pumps have been in operation for 30 to 40 years. And and that's the water supply. That supplies that lower Assiniboine watershed and become, you know, very important. Uh, when it's this hot and dry, you end up with more evaporation losses throughout the system. And then as the groundwater, as plants need water, you also end up more water going into recharge groundwater. So um, those are the kind of things that limit the downstream um, uses of water. And it's just not as simple to say, well, you can pump more because there ends up being, and especially on the, on the LaSalle system, there's some channel capacities uh, system. So if you pump more water here, you actually get flooding here um, that comes in and there's transit time. But we work very closely with our colleagues, with Manitoba Infrastructure, with Conservation and Climate, and with the water side of our department. Um, so there, there's a lot of cooperation and collaboration that goes back and forth. Right. Well, uh, Friday, Sarah, is there any questions irrigation wise or otherwise that have come in in the? No, in the... we don't have anything yet. Uh, okay. No questions. So, yeah. Well, thank, thank you for watching. Um, well, I, I, we've run a fair bit later than I had uh, planned, but I mean, uh, the topic of irrigation is definitely. Uh, a hot topic now, if you want to call it that. Uh, 
one thing uh, well thanks brian for for being uh being available um now Lori, i'm wondering if you could launch the last question for today i sure can thank you all right so our last question today is if you are a horticultural producer based on the discussion we just had do you think that you require a water use license? If you want to select one of those, we have three options this time, yes, no, or possibly. So we're just giving a couple seconds here more. People are voting. We added the possibly just in case you weren't quite sure and uh, need some further information. So give a couple more seconds here. And I think we're ready to share those results. So we have 25% yes, 25% no, and 50% possibly. Wow, that's very interesting to see. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank everyone for, uh, for attending. And uh, I'll just check with Pratty Sarah one more time. Any questions show up before we head out? No. No okay. question. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, thanks to everyone who uh, who attended. Uh, we, we really value feedback and comments, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. It all helps uh, create better content for uh, webinars and maybe in a post-COVID uh, world, uh, actual in-person meetings. Um, the next webinar in this series will be two weeks from today. That's uh, August 6th, 9.30 in the morning, and hope to see you then. Thanks very much for your time this morning. Have a good day.